good to be with you here at Sharon, whether you're here in person, and we have several people here, and whether you're out there or online, and we're grateful for the opportunity to be together on this beautiful day. It is a beautiful day because God gave it to us, and we don't fear this day. <laughs> we don't fear God. Here we are. Uh, we are moving forward through the new year. Something that uh, I do want to know is, you to know is that we're organizing a lot of things now at the beginning of the year. One of those things has to do with lining people up to serve in different capacities to support the worship service. And Carrie needs to talk to you just a moment about that on behalf yes. of Susie and the rest of the worship team. Good morning, Sharon Church family. Um, your worship committee is actually going to try something a little different this year. We are implementing a sign-up sheet for the volunteers for Sunday morning, both services, 845 and 11. So whether you filled out the ministry service um, interest surveys or not, um, maybe you're an usher, maybe you like to serve communion, um, this is a place for us to organize and kind of work ahead so you can sign up for this and this will give us a place to reference and check and help us with the bulletin. But we'll keep this out front on Sunday mornings at the table when you come in the main doors. But it'll also be in the office um, for any questions and also to allow the worship team to make the reminder calls too. So thank you. Thanks, Carrie. And really, anybody is welcome to be part of that. It really don't have to have any qualifications other than you want to do it and you will come and, and show up when you're supposed to. So we're grateful for that opportunity. Monday evening is the first meeting of our new leadership board, our new governance board here at Sharon. That is not a closed or secret meeting. It's at six o'clock over in the central meeting room in the crossing building, but we're excited about that. I appreciate your patience as this team just begins even to get to know each other. So uh, I appreciate you during this time of transition, but I'm excited about what God will do through that group. I'll also read a thank you note that came from Brunswick Family Assistance. It is to Sharon United Methodist Church. On behalf of Brunswick Family Assistance, the board, the employees, and volunteers, and most especially our clients, thank you for your donation of $10,000. I don't know if you know that or not, but because of the prosperity and the hard work going on at the Rose of Sharon, we sent $10,000 recently to Brunswick Family Assistance. During these difficult economic times, more and more of our Brunswick County neighbors are finding it necessary to come to BFA. Without individuals and groups like yourself, we would be unable to accomplish our mission of improving the lives of families and individuals in crisis, nor secure our vision of a community where all people have access to an adequate and nutrition supply of food and resources to sustain themselves, we pledge our best efforts to continue to utilize your funds wisely. Your support helps to make this a better place to live. Please accept our sincere appreciation. And so I wanted you to share, it's making a difference when you <laughs> donate items to the Rose, when you, when you work with Tina at the Rose, when you purchase items at the Rose. And I think on this Martin Luther King weekend that we can partner with groups like Brunswick Family Assistance whose goal it is to make this world more equitable, more fair, more just. I think that's a beautiful thing that we are lining up with those, those visions that are important, not just for our country, but are important for the kingdom of God, of which Sharon United Methodist Church is part. In your bulletins are listed our prayer requests that have come in this week, and so please join in praying for Claude and Diane Keeney, Sylvia Ludlam, Jessica Gardner, Nell Eady, Sherry Dozier, Rick Fields, Linda Mullinax, and the families of Joan Lovett and Mark Magelli. And this week we're lifting up the persecuted Christian Church in Somalia. At this time, 
I invite you to enter into a time of worship. Good morning. There we go. Will you please stand and worship with us this morning? Gracious God, we acknowledge you this morning as the guest of honor at our worship celebration. As we give you the praise and honor that you are due, fill us with your Holy Spirit that you might merge with your kingdom's mission as we seek to love you and love our neighbors as well. Be glorified, Lord. Amen. Please recite with me our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He, they, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We're hooked up to the internet. We've got Chuck, who you may not have met yet, on the drums today. Susie's over there, Rusty's over here, Melanie's up here, and, and then Mitch on the bass. It's a truly maybe what a legacy praise team ought to look like because it's so intergenerational. And I thank you for what you've done this morning. And uh, for those of you who are out there, I hope that you will come in person next week and enjoy what it feels like to be in this holy space. I know you gotta do what you gotta do, but there is good things going on, and when we come together in person for worship, when God shows up, it's better than staying home. It's better than staying home. And so I just wanted to put that out to you. But I invite you now to just join me in prayer. Gracious God, it is a wonderful opportunity whenever we can come together to worship you. We were created to worship you. Not like people worship football. Not like people worship their favorite actors and actresses. Not like people worship their sports leagues and activities that keep them busy. 
we worship you as our source of life. You fulfill us. You give us purpose. You created us. You know every hair on our head. You understand how many days we have on this earth before we meet you in heaven and take our place in the Father's house. God, we worship your holy name. We, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit this morning. Give you all the honor and the glory that you are due when we came out this morning despite what, what was going on with raindrops coming out. We came out this morning to worship you. We made a choice. We're not asking that you would fill us up. We're not asking you that you would do something for us right now. Right now, we ask that you would receive our worship as a pleasing aroma rising up from this sanctuary. And yes, from those homes where people are huddled around their devices, along with those who all around the planet are worshiping you this morning. Receive our praise because you are due it. Of course, Lord, you know this is not the kind of paradise you created for us. There's brokenness, there's sickness and disease, there's poverty, there's lack, there's also gluttony and selfishness and greed. So we lift ourselves to you in prayer, praying that we would live lives that you created us to live. So yes, Lord, heal the broken bodies, cure the diseases, fill our stomachs, keep those roofs over our heads. But as you do that, God, May we truly understand who we are as your children, what it means to serve you, what it means to put you first, what it means to practice your kind of generosity, what it means to practice your kind of selflessness, selflessness and service. Put us to work for your kingdom. And we thank you for the opportunities that we already have and for the people that are giving of themselves through Sharon Church and through the organizations that we support, like Brunswick Family Assistance and many others. Lord, help us to partner any way we can for kingdom work, for kingdom good. We want to be a shining light in dark places. Mostly we thank you for your son Jesus who offered himself, inserted himself into this broken world, taught us how to live a perfect life, showed us how to do it, invited some people, discipled them, brought them into the kingdom, and taught them how to do the same. And Lord, we want to be part of that discipleship process. We want to be part of your kingdom work. We want to be involved in whatever you want to bless. We give ourselves to you this morning. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. This not intend to deliver us from evil. What is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever? Amen. I think the ushers should come forward at this time. We have this opportunity to give and receive our tithes and offerings.
dedicate these tithes and offerings, this money, to the furthering of your kingdom. We want to make a difference as you have called us to serve. May we be found faithful as you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. This morning we continue our readings from Isaiah. We're reading Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 to 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your hand and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. As, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. May God add his blessing to the reading of this gospel reading today and to our understanding. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable to you. You are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Most of us are old enough to remember, so I invite you to travel back to 1978. Picture yourself sitting in front of your television set. You only had one of them, right? You're watching your television, your favorite show, and suddenly there's a commercial break. 
And there was actor Orson Welles. He's on your screen making a pitch for Paul Masson Champagne. Back when they used to do that on TV, remember that? Paul Masson Champagne. And, and he's pouring a glass of champagne at this dinner table, and he says this, I like to cast a party the way I cast a play with very special people. And that champagne must be very special. Paul Masson wines taste so good because they're made with such care. Old Paul Masson said it himself nearly a century ago. Say it with me. We will sell no wine before it's time. Remember? We will sell no wine before it's time. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Megan, you're going to have to look that up on the YouTube. Those are dead. Those are dead. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> you too, Chuck. So, <clears throat> I'm no wine expert. I really am not. But I think you understand that there are just some things that are not as good if they are served or put to work or they're not as effective as they could be if they haven't reached their proper time. Wine is one of those things, I guess. Our gospel reading this morning has to do with the question of whether or not in the context of this wedding banquet, it was Jesus' time. Jesus' time. Let's take a look at what the gospel writer describes as the first of the signs revealed of the glory of Jesus Christ. Shall we? I know many of you have studied this lots and lots of times and have heard lots of messages. That's why I'm, I'm asking for God's help. We would see something different in this than maybe we've seen before. If you've studied John's gospel very much, you know that the sole purpose of John's gospel is to proclaim the good news that Jesus the Christ was the son of the living God. And not only was he the son of the living God, but with the Father and the Holy Spirit formed the Godhead of what we know as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit together. Jesus was the one that the Apostle Paul had written about in his letter to the Colossians. Jesus was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. How about that? How about that? John was writing about this. So why do you suppose, we've been asking this question this week around here, why do you suppose the first public miracle that Jesus performed was not some kind of healing of a broken or sick person, not an exorcism driving a demon out of somebody, but simply to keep a party going. Because that's exactly what was going on, right? They didn't have any more wine. <laughs> that was going to be a problem. I believe that turning water into wine is a first glimpse that we are given into a, the heavenly joy of the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. He didn't just come here to make people comfortable. He came here to release heavenly joy. And where, where better to do it than at a banquet with a wedding with two young people who were going to be tied together Not just overcoming hardship, not just overcoming discomfort, but ushering in the new heaven and a new earth. Probably Martin Luther King would say to, to some of the people that he was speaking to who had lived under such oppression and limitations, 
he would say to them about this scripture, Jesus is more than just you surviving your circumstances, singing songs like swing low, sweet chariot, come and take us out of this mess. But rather, Jesus is establishing a kingdom now that will release you for joyful obedience in this world and in the world to come. Now, the framework for the next part of what I'm going to be saying, actually, I, I took from, I was inspired by the, a, a sermon, or actually a, a lesson given to some students at Oxford, this higher institution of learning in England, where some of the best young minds learn, but yet who know very little about Jesus The Reverend Timothy Keller, who's actually a very well-known Presbyterian pastor, was speaking to these students, and he gave a little framework that I've kind of used to frame my thinking about the mission of Jesus at this wedding. What exactly is being revealed about the mission of Jesus, particularly in the context of Jesus being there with his mother and his disciples at this wedding? First of all, what it's telling us is that Jesus is always the master of the banquet. No matter where he is, Jesus is always the master of the banquet. Where earthly masters fail, and these, these humans did fail. They didn't provide enough for the guests that had come. And it would have been a terrible, terrible talked about for many, many weeks and years to come, that failure to provide enough for the people who had come with expectations about what it would be like to be part of that wedding banquet. Jesus always comes through. Psalm 34 says, taste and see, taste and see that the Lord is good. Imagine the, the wine that I guess was considered the best of the wine, even at the end of the party, their God was revealing in what Jesus could do, taste and see what I can do. The second part of this framework is that Jesus came to purify us. Jesus came to purify all people. The water in those stone jars, and it was all those gallons, right? Gallons and gallons. That was a lot of wine in the end. I don't know how many guests were there, but those jars of water were not drinking water. They were water that was used for the purification rites of the Jewish people. And so it was water for cleansing, water for purification, definitely not for drinking. But there it was, it was on site the potential to purify people on the outside, to cleanse them so that they could be at a party like that because they were going to invoke the presence of Almighty God in those marriage rites. I think that water that came out of those purification jars was the best wine because Jesus had made it pure. Absolutely pure. In the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, just a few pages in my Bible from this story, Jesus is talking to a, a lonely woman who was an outcast who was gathering water at a well. And remember what Jesus told her, if you ask me for it, I will give you water springing up from an eternal well. And she said, give me some of that water. Jesus came to purify us came to purify that lady at the well. He came to purify the guests at the wedding. Thirdly, when Jesus took over, and he did, Jesus took over. He did what his mom wanted him to do. When he took over as master of ceremonies, that wedding, he took away the shame of the groom. 
took away the shame of the master of ceremonies, who would have been terribly embarrassed. In the language of today, people would have looked at that groom and they would have said, you have one job. You've had a whole year to prepare for this day. You've had a whole year, one job, to make sure that this was the perfect wedding. Blew it. Why would somebody want to marry somebody like you that can't be trusted with this one thing? Jesus took that shame right away. Nobody even ever knew about it. Nobody even knew about it. Just this little tiny group. Even the master of ceremonies didn't even know. Jesus was propping him up and taking away his guilt, taking away his feelings of incompetence, taking away the shame, saving it. Jesus did what they couldn't do. It's good stuff, isn't it? Jesus is the master of the banquet. Jesus can and will purify us. And Jesus takes away our shame and provides for us. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And I think that's why, I think that's why at that wedding, God's glory was revealed for the first time in a miracle in that setting. Lastly, this is my stuff. What's the deal with Jesus telling his mother, my hour has not yet come? That's perplexed people over the years, hasn't it? My time has not yet come. I find that most people interpret this to mean that Jesus wasn't really ready to reveal himself as Messiah yet. He, he had other things he needed to do before he revealed his, his Messiahship, his sentship, his, his true identity. And that's a reasonable expectation. He kind of just said, it's not like mom. Mom. <laughs> Anybody that has a mom knows how this must have looked. It's not time, mom. And the look on her face must have been, yeah, actually it is. I've been knowing about this since before you were born. Do something now. I'd like you to consider this comment about his time not being yet from a different perspective, if, if you will. Everywhere else in the gospel, especially in John, when Jesus refers to his time, either not yet being his time, or when he actually utters, my time has come. He's referring not to something like a wedding or revealing that he's Messiah, but rather it's revealing the fact that he's not ready to die yet. His time, everywhere else in the gospel, means my time to die and be offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the world hasn't come yet. And so I'm wondering about why it would be different this time. Jesus had been invited to the wedding of a young couple whose time had come. This was their day. It was the day they'd been dreaming about, planning for, getting ready for, saving up for. Same thing with the parents. It was their day. Jesus was there as a guest. But in saving the couple's wedding, in the way that Jesus did it, was revealing himself as the ultimate bridegroom. This was the first time we start seeing the theological concept of Jesus being the bridegroom of the church was not going to be the bridegroom of this young woman. John is starting to build the case that he had come to basically fulfill Isaiah's prophecy that the people would be married to God, right? Isn't that what Jonas just read? 
You can go back and read the Old Testament reading. In first century Jewish culture, after a couple was engaged or betrothed to one another, the bride-to-be would stay with her parents for a year. And during that year, the groom spent all of his time after he got his work done setting up a home for his bride in his father's house, right? And when it was time for the wedding to happen, he would come, the marriage would take place, and he would take her home to the father's house, and they would live together forever and ever. That's how first century Jewish families work. They get engaged, promised to one another, they separate for a year to make preparations and get ready, and then on the right day, and there are all kinds of other traditions wrapped up in all of this, but the groom came to claim his bride. There's multiple levels of that going on here in this particular passage of scripture. At the surface level, these young people were having a wedding and Jesus saved the day. And that's pretty good just on its own. But for us who are now in the 21st century, and we've been reading about this and praying about this and studying about this and hearing about it all this time, we, we must believe, right, that one day Jesus' time did come. His time did come. As a matter of fact, um, in the Passion narrative in John chapter 12, Jesus is praying, praying to the Father, and he's getting ready to share with his disciples about what's going to happen. And Jesus actually says, my time has come. My time has come. time for me to be glorified. He wasn't just saying it's time for me to die. But he knew what would happen after that. He would be glorified. A little later that evening as Jesus went to speak with his disciples at that Passover meal, what we know as the Last Supper, he was teaching them the fact that he was going to be betrayed that evening and he was going to be taken off, arrested, in prison, suffering hardship, and eventually death. But while he was doing that teaching, he said those words that we have in our Bibles. In John chapter 14, he says, I am going to my father's house. You can't come with me, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. So that when I come, and this is where we need to get excited about it, when I come, I will take you to myself, into my Father's house, and there we shall be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. At the very end of the Bible, in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19 verses 1 through 9. I, see, we're, at this point, we're not talking about those kids getting married. Now we're talking about Jesus, and now we're talking about us. And now we're talking about things that have not happened yet but are promised to us. Now, there's a lot of mystery to this, there's a lot of context in it, but just listen to these words that Jesus gave to John in this revelation. Chapter 19. I'm going to just read the first uh, nine verses. Again, this is about future glory. And we, we are, by faith, the bride of Christ. Are you willing to receive that? We are the bride of Christ. And Jesus is the groom. We're destined to be together. We're promised to one another. The blood of Jesus has sealed that for us. I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! 
salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. We need to hear these words in the times we're living in. Once more, the voices said, Hallelujah. The smoke goes up from her forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and all who fear him, small and great. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multi multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are true words of God. John goes on to say at that he just fell down. <laughs> Jesus can perform miracles. Jesus could get rid of COVID-19. Jesus could get you out of that wheelchair. Jesus could save some of your marriages. Jesus could fill this place with hundreds of people singing anytime. And I, I wouldn't tell you for a second that Jesus isn't going to do it. Jesus could do that today. But Jesus' true job is to invite us into that love relationship where we are promised to each other so that while we're waiting, for the consummation that will come someday. And if you go on a little bit in Revelation, you'll see that's where there are no sick people. There are no diseases. There's definitely nobody walking on crutches. There's definitely nobody that can't hear or can't see. There's definitely nobody whose relationship is on the rocks. While we're waiting for that day, we've been given hope and a promise. Hope and a promise. And we've been given each other, church. That's why I'm so sad so many of you aren't coming to be here with each other. You're not coming on Wednesday. You're not coming when we invite you. And you're missing out. Jesus wants us to be together. Guess who doesn't want us to be together? The devil just loves it. When we're having trouble before the wedding, when we're wondering if there's even going to be a wedding, the good news is today, Jesus is the master of our banquet. Not only is he the master of our banquet, he's the guest of honor. And guess who's going to be seated with him at the banquet? us. And if you will receive it, this is a glimpse of how God feels about you and me. How, how God feels about you and me. What an honor. What a privilege. What a beautiful thing. And as we pray for healings and as we pray for breakthroughs in our divisive world that we live in, 
just know this, God is on the throne. And we have everything we need to be successful, to live joy-filled, beautiful lives, even in the midst of our struggles. Believe that. I'm going to pray as the praise team comes forward to end our time together. God, I know it's hard for everyone to, to trust, to really believe that things will get better someday. Physical ailments and relationship issues and financial struggles and fear, anxiety, uncertainty, anger, injustice. I don't know what Martin Luther King would think if, if he was living in the, this country right now. But we do, Lord, acknowledge that you are Lord over our land. We, we know that our founders said that this was a, a land where we have freedom. Life, freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So as we pursue what it really is like to be free, what it really is like to live this life that you've given to us and to pursue happiness and joy, fill us once again, Lord, with your spirit. Purify our hearts. Fill us so that we're overflowing with love and compassion out into the neighborhoods we live in, out into the places where we work and go to school, the clubs and organizations we belong to. Lord, may our cups overflow with fresh new wine. We'll give you the praise and the glory. Please stand and worship with us.
go out and experience God's joy, shall we? Even if it looks like hunkering down, <laughs> hunkering down with a grilled cheese sandwich today, <laughs> I release you. Try Sunday school today. What else do you have to do? It's open. Go in the name of the Father who loves you and provides for you. In the name of the Son, Jesus, the master of every banquet. And the Holy Spirit brings it all to life. He gifts us. What, what more could we ask? Hallelujah. Amen.